Our first speaker is Professor Harry Quigley I'm from John Hopkins. I'm happy to be asked to give a talk here at the Heidelberg meeting. And the subject of my talk is how we will soon be able to use optic nerve head dynamics measured by OCT as a biomarker in glaucoma diagnosis. For this, I should mention the method we're using here. We have a patent pending in the United States for how it's done. Heidelberg has loaned us the instrument that we used without me uh, having any financial support from the company, and we also work with other companies. When we talk about the intraocular pressure, we actually should consider that there are many intraocular pressures. There's the level at the clinic visit, but there are variations shown below here that occur in the eye in real time within seconds. The pictures below are taken by Crawford Downs Group with monkeys in which the intraocular pressure was being measured with dramatic changes with eye movements and blinking, as well as the known changes in a diurnal intraocular pressure change. And what we really need to know is what the pressure is over a long period of time, both as an average and fluctuation. We are coming closer to being able to do this using the Eye Care Home, a device that's now approved in the United States. And here you see the variations, even in the course of one day, on average, in a particular patient, with substantially higher numbers in the early morning hours compared to the evening or uh, even in the middle of the night. We're coming closer to continuous intraocular pressure monitoring with two companies working on devices that will be implanted inside the eye and telemeter the eye pressure on a regular basis. I think this will lead us to finally understand which eye pressure parameter is the most important in glaucoma. But the responses of the eye tissues and the cells in the eye to the intraocular pressure vary depending upon which time frame one is discussing. Some of the response mechanisms uh, respond relatively quickly, though they probably don't respond to every second changes in eye pressure. Others ignore rapid force changes, such as the ocular pulse, and act as bandpass filters, only responding to more long-term changes. And there are, in fact, mechanosensitive channels in the astrocytes and axons, as well as integrin-linked signaling from the extracellular matrix to the cell cytoskeleton. The fibrous changes of the optic nerve head in glaucoma have been well documented, as here shown with scanning electron microscopy. And the, the remodeling effect of glaucoma causes the lamina to collapse downward and outward under the sclera, under Brooks membrane. The attachment of the lamina cribrosa rotates uh, backward and outward and the beams of the lamina fibrosa spread out like little umbrellas, attaching themselves and holding on to the sclera, which is pulling with hoop stress uh, based on the intraocular pressure level and fluctuation. The astrocytes shown here in color in the human eye below are both connected to the peripapillary sclera and also to the beams of the lamina fibrosa. Those contain connective tissue in the human eye, and it is both the response of the fibers as well as the cells that we want to study. The cellular response is extraordinarily complex and contains mechanosensitive units, the uh, alpha and beta dimers of integrins, connecting them through seven other molecules to the actin myosin cytoskeleton of the cell. We know that the peripapillary sclera is a ring of both collagen and elastin, both shown here in the human in the left and the, in the mouse eye in the right. And when glaucoma is experimentally produced in mouse eyes, there's a significant change in the ordered ring of peripapillary collagen, as well as a change of elastin orientation and configuration in the nerve head. So there are long-term remodeling changes that go on. We recently studied a, a series of human glaucoma eyes post-mortem, conducting a quite detailed histopathology of what's gone on with time in the eye. 
This involved taking uh, second harmonic generation images, digitizing them, and studying the images of both qualitatively and quantitatively. And as you can see, there are dramatic changes in each of the aspects of the optic nerve head. Summarizing this work done by a student, Carolyn Guan, indicated that eyes that had worse glaucoma damage had thinner connective tissue beams, more astrocytes, and astrocytes and their product, collagen type 4 basement membrane, filling in the pores where the axons had been before they atrophied. Carolyn found that the beams of the lamina were narrower or thinner and lower beam area or thinner beams was shown by Tracy Ling in our group to indicate a greater strain with the stress of intraocular pressure. So the normal anatomy of the optic nerve head indicating that the connective tissues of the lower pole and upper pole are less dense, we now know they also are straining more at the same intraocular pressure. The places where there's less connective tissue give more with intraocular pressure as shown in the red ovals. These are the areas that are preferentially damaged in glaucoma and through those areas past the axons that are most susceptible to glaucoma leading to the typical pattern of damage in glaucoma. We now move to how we're using and will use OCT imaging to look at both the short-term and long-term behavior of the lamina. Dr. Vicki Nguyen, a mechanical engineering professor at Johns Hopkins who's worked with me, has worked out methods by which we can isolate within OCT images the lamina cribrosa, shown here as the blue zone in the picture. In order to show stress-strain analysis, one has to have images taken at two different pressures. And we've used a number of methods, most prominently a suture lysis after trabeculectomy glaucoma surgery and starting of eye drops or stopping eye drops, which we've done in quite a number of eyes. And I'm going to show you what that indicates. First, the DVC method that's being used, the digital volume correlation method, takes uh, 24 radial B scans and produces a three-dimensional uh, image of the lamina cribrosa. The method then takes the undeformed volume and compares it to the deformed volume, meaning the two at two different pressures, and indicates in thousands and thousands of 50 by 50 by 50 micron voxels which of the reflectance positions has changed and how it changed and in what direction. These can be converted into color images showing in the lamina cribrosa between the uh, solid lines colors indicating strain, how much the tissue has either expanded or contracted or gone into a shear. What we found with eyes that had undergone a pressure lowering by suture lysis after trabeculectomy, within a 20 minute period, the lamina cribrosa changed by moving in the shape of one type of can to another type of can. The easiest way is uh, if you could think of what tuna comes in, a, a flat, larger diameter can, the lamina becomes narrower and higher. That is, it expands in tensile strain, uh, much like a, an orange juice can. Interestingly, the maximum strains were greater in eyes that had more nerve fiber layer damage or more visual field damage. This indicates that either these eyes had damage uh, because they originally had more strain or that during the period of time that glaucoma occurred in their eyes, the strains got greater. We've also raised the eye pressure in the case of this research that's shown in this slide. It was done by having a swimming goggle with no lenses and the images were taken before the goggles were on and then after. This indicated also that higher pressure produced compression that is opposite of what happened with lowered eye pressure. So the same finding would occur whether one raised or lowered the eye pressure as long as there weren't other factors going on. In order to make this a much more practical method that could be used in clinics, we've now begun measuring the difference in eye pressure and the strains generated by differences in eye pressure when patients either started a new eye drop such as latanoprost 
or if they were using latanoprost when they stopped taking the latanoprost and the pressure rose. And indeed, what we found was that when the pressure was lowered, there was expansive axial strain, that is the lamina got taller, and compressive radial strain, meaning that it got narrower, just like the data from suture lysis. So in addition, there was greater compliance with worse nerve fiber layer or worse visual field indices. In other words, the worse was the glaucoma, the greater was the strain. This flies in the face of the standard thought process expressed in many papers that glaucoma eyes are stiffer than normal. Uh, we will need to study uh, much more whether eyes are stiffer or not compared to normal, but the suggestion that the worse the glaucoma, the greater the compliance, certainly is uh, suggestive that greater strain is not a good sign. Interestingly, we've done studies of post-mortem human eyes measuring strain, and in those eyes, the more severe the glaucoma, the greater the strain as well. So both in living and dead eyes, this seems to be a, a universal rule. Even more interesting, when we took some of the eyes that had undergone glaucoma surgery, we'd measured their strain at suture lysis within the week or two after surgery, and then we took further images one to four years later those optic nerve heads had dramatically changed even more over a period of time. And this tells us that there's a time-limited remodeling process going on in the optic nerve head. The changes one year later were 10 times greater than the acute viscoelastic change that happened when the patient had just had suture lysis. So as a result, intraocular pressure lowering leads, leads to expansion of the lamina, Intraocular pressure increase causes it to compress. Those are essentially what we would have thought. But what I'm telling you is we can measure it quantitatively and measure its variation across patients, both in the individual patient over time and across patients cross-sectionally. And soon we will be doing this in a longitudinal study. Interestingly, greater glaucoma damage has been associated with greater compliance, but were they more compliant at baseline or did they become that way over time? That's what we need to study next. Some have questioned whether or not we can use washing out of drops as a method for measuring our strains, but we now can, as shown here, do home eye care measurements of patients who stop their eye drops and we will know within one day when the pressure has risen to a level that would then allow us to take the second image and then reinitiate the eye drop measurement. So this is going to be a safe and effective way for us to test lots of glaucoma patients. In fact, using this, we could test any glaucoma patient under medical therapy. So soon by either adding or subtracting eye drops temporarily for a patient and doing two images by OCT, we're going to have a potential biomarker which might predict the likelihood of future rate of greater damage. This is extremely important because some patients have an aggressive form of glaucoma while others are really relatively stable and could undergo less detailed examinations or less aggressive pressure lowering. A longitudinal prospective study is needed and we hope to have the funding to have that done quite soon. So finally, Testing by OCT using an appropriate instrument and appropriate methods will likely be able to help us to determine the susceptibility to future damage in any clinic using available instrumentation. Thank you very much.